This is Emily Blackshear with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at the Oklahoma State University Library. Today is Friday, November 6, 2020, and I'm in Stillwater, Oklahoma, conducting this interview remotely. This morning, I'm interviewing Belinda Bruner for the Deep Roots Oklahoma Authors Oral History Project. Belinda, you're a literary scholar, a poet, and you're also working on a novel. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me. Thank you. Let's start uh, here. Oh, yeah, oh, go ahead. I, I like to talk about Oklahoma in my writing. So yes, thank yes. you for having me. Yeah, I'm, you write, you have a lot of things about place and mm -hmm. all sorts of experiences that mm -hmm. I'm just really excited that, that you're here. So let's start with where you were born and where did you grow up? I was born in Durant, Oklahoma. Some people call it Durant. Mm -hmm. And grew up most of the time in southeastern Oklahoma. For a while, we lived in Oklahoma City, but for the most of my growing up, it was in southeastern Oklahoma. It's beautiful, but it's kind of a terrible, it's beautiful and terrible. Beautiful at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't that just kind of. Yeah, uh, that kind of. Broken bow? Kind of, Is this uh -huh. broken bow? You? Yeah, okay. well, I, we lived out in the country between Broken Bow and Ida Bell. Oh, okay. But um, all the whole area down there is kind of home. So, mm -hmm. yeah, describe the area for anyone who might be listening to this um, who isn't familiar. What What's it like? There's a, a good mixture in southeastern Oklahoma of bottomland and regular land. Mm -hmm. And the dirt is red in the regular part, but if you go into the bottomland, you get really dark, fertile soil. So it's kind of striking to see that red against almost black in the soil. And the trees are amazing down there. It's actually been tapped into by national logging companies and things like that. Um, there's a beautiful lake, Broken Bow Lake, where the water is blue and there are little green islands in the water. So it's very beautiful, but of course it's man-made. Almost all the lakes in Oklahoma are man-made. Right. So did you spend much time going to town and did you go to Broken Bow or Ida Bell when you had to go to town for something? We, well, we did both. My dad's office was in Idabel, but our school we were enrolled in was in Broken Bow. Oh, okay. So we uh, went to either way to town, probably Broken Bow more often because my family's church was there. Mm -hmm. And um, we uh, spent a lot of time at the church when I was growing up the Presbyterian Church, because that's how my parents met. Oh, really? Yeah, they actually both survived or endured or were blessed by mission schools. Mm -hmm. But they weren't the missions made by the Catholic Church. They were by the Presbyterian Church. So my dad went to Goodland Academy for Indian boys. Mm -hmm. And my mom went to Press Mex in Taft, Texas, and they were both run by the Presbyterian Church. Then they got scholarships, both of them. So they met at Oklahoma Presbyterian College, which used to be in Durant, and then it kind of became a part of Southeastern. Hmm. Did they talk much about their experiences at, at these schools, at the mission schools? Yeah, they see, did quite a bit. Yeah. And they, um, see, they were, I don't know, they were kind of unique, both of my fam sides of my family. But they really took the education that was available to them and made the most of it, you know, and they loved to tell us about meeting at OPC so much that we would ask them, you know, tell us a story about OPC and they had lots of things to tell. My mother, um, she's bilingual, and 
when she was first in college, she had to do a report on Henri Matisse. So for a young Mexican woman to say a French word, it was kind of <laughs> a big deal. So yeah. she asked my dad to help her and he said, well, I'm no linguist, but Mr. So-and-so lives by my sister and he will know the answer. I bet he wouldn't mind if we went over there. So they showed up at their teachers, one of the teachers, professor's house, and he told her how to say Henri Matisse, and she practiced all the way home and complains that she still only got a B plus. <laughs> but um, they, they liked school and they liked to help each other with their projects and things like that. Yeah. Did you grow up speaking Spanish in the home or what, what was we the spoke, situation with that? We spoke English because my dad preferred English. Mm -hmm. And then we did speak a little bit of Spanish when we were preschool age and our mother stayed home with us. But when we started public school and we realized that none of the other kids were saying hola, we just refused to speak mm -hmm. Spanish anymore. Mm -hmm. So we lost out on that opportunity. Yeah. And maybe we'll talk about this in a minute, but I know you have a, a poem that you've written called mm -hmm. Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll, let's get, get to that um, in a second, because I'd like to talk a little bit more about um, just your, your early life. Are there particular memories that might stand out to you in school, maybe interacting with the other children or um, any experiences that you had maybe with teachers down the road that were mm -hmm. influential or, or memorable to you? Yeah, the main thing that I got out of school was a lot of social maladjustment mm -hmm. because the kids, all thought we were Native American hmm. because they weren't used to any Mexican people living around there. So they would, they were really racist in Southeastern Oklahoma against Native Americans. So they would make fun of us. Um, the teachers needed to write down what tribe we were because then they would get money from the tribe to the school and from the government. So they kept asking us over and over. And finally, one of the teachers said she would give me a nickel if I told her what tribe I was from. And I didn't know what to say because I wasn't, I didn't even know what she was talking about. Yeah. But um, my brother, on the other hand, who is way more sociable and gregarious, told his teacher that he didn't know what tribe it was, but he knew his daddy was the chief. <laughs> so what did they a, say to that? Did he have, have that just, whole? <laughs> they just laughed at him. Yeah. And then, you know, they kind of left him alone. But me, because it bothered me so much, because I was a little older and I knew what was happening. Mm -hmm. um, I never, I didn't make any friends until my one friend in school moved there in the fourth grade. So it really played a big role in my development as a writer because mm -hmm. the only thing I could think of to do at recess was to read a novel. So I would stand against the brick schoolhouse and read a novel every day while the other kids were playing, you know, those little clapping games that mm -hmm. girls play with yeah them, and they sing songs my mother wouldn't let me sing songs about boys kissing boys and things like that so I just read at recess mm -hmm. and um, in the fourth grade I was reading a book that was in Spanish and the kids noticed so the next thing I knew I was giving Spanish lessons on the playground Oh, really? <laughs> and then my one friend that I that I made, Diane Jordan, she came in the fourth grade back to the area. She had lived there before. So once I had 
a really good friend, I was fine, but it was a struggle at first. So I just focused on reading. Is there a particular book that you remember from that time that gave you a lot of comfort or one that you just really enjoyed that made an impression that you'd like to talk more about? I really, it sounds kind of dorky, but I love Heidi. Mm -hmm. And I learned from Heidi a lot about perseverance and about how to behave when you're around different people. And I just liked learning about different cultures and ways of living. See my, my uh, grandparents on my dad's side, they lived near the Goodland Academy and they lived as though it were still like the 1950s mm -hmm. or even older than that. So they didn't have plumbing, they didn't have running water. And when we went to stay with them, we it was like going back in time. Yeah. So we got to just draw water from the pump to help our grandma and work in the garden, play with cows, things like that mm -hmm. but it was all done in a real old-fashioned way and then in the evening after all the day's work was done we would sit on the porch and um, just listen to all the night sounds and my grandma could identify everything so it was really peaceful to be yeah. out there yeah that sounds like it and was storytelling as, as a group was that uh, was that something that you enjoyed doing together? Yeah, well? my mom is very talkative and her sisters. And then my dad, he knows a lot of old stories, like about old people or Native American people or all these old things that happened a long time ago. He was also really good at math. So he used to teach kids how to do their algebra in the dirt, just writing oh, in really? the dirt with a stick. And, um, but yeah, he would, they would both tell us lots of stories about how they grew up. And both of them picked cotton. They had families that either my dad's family was growing cotton, whereas my mom's family was picking it for white people that owned it. But, um, they both grew up with that kind of lifestyle, even though my dad's was more white and Choctaw and my mom's was Mexican. Mm -hmm. It was still a real similar background that they had. Mm -hmm. What did you all enjoy doing as a family? And you mentioned your brother. Is that a, a younger brother? Is that mm -hmm. your only sibling? Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Well, see, there was tax season and after tax season because my dad was a CPA. I even have a published <laughs> poem called yeah. After Tax Season. Yeah, yeah, I think I've got and uh, that here. So if it were in the fall, we would go fishing, we would go to high school football games, things like that. But if it were in the spring, we couldn't do anything with our dad because he had to work all the time for tax season. Right. And, uh, but it explains a lot when you think back, like I think, why do I know all the rules of football, but I don't know the rules of basketball. And I realize basketball <laughs> season is during tax season. Yeah, that's at the at the height of it, especially yeah. in March. <laughs> so we never got to go to a single basketball game except one time. And my dad, my brother happened to be playing. So, and we're all very short. So this was a, an amazing thing that my brother was picked to play. And my dad just happened to go that one night and he said hey they're putting Clayton out that's my brother mm -hmm. so we're all watching him <laughs> and yeah. he made a he made a layup and scored two points making a layup so oh, wow. he it was pretty exciting that my dad just happened to catch that because mm -hmm. that was the only basketball game we ever went to oh my goodness yeah I could did he ever start going after um he retired no, he no. never did. 
No, he just, we just learned about football. Okay. So we would, we would do that, but um, our grandparents would play with us too. You know, like mm -hmm. they were real active and played games with us. And that was always yeah. exciting to get adults to play with you. Oh yeah. What kind of games <clears throat> did they like? Well, to my play grandma with? really liked sports and she would play she would pitch for us to play ba baseball and things oh, nice. like that. How fun. And she used to be a basketball player when she was in school. Oh, wow. Yeah, she only went to like the sixth grade or something. My dad's parents, my mom's parents didn't really get to go to school, mm -hmm. but they were all real interesting people. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like it. So what's your earliest memory of creating a story or a song or a poem? So I think you started pretty young from what I recall mm -hmm. when we talked before this interview. Well, so the first story I wrote was about a squash mm -hmm. who ran away from the garden to join the circus. I'm not sure why I wrote that, but I don't know if I didn't like squash or <laughs> if I just felt sorry for the garden vegetables, but this squash ran away and found a circus to join. Of course, if you know anything about southeastern Oklahoma, you know that the winter home for one of the circuses is down there where my dad grew up. Mm -hmm. So we we could not only had all those woods to play in, but we could pretend that a lion escaped and was trying to come through the woods to get us and things like that. So the second thing I wrote was a poem and it was commemorating the walk on the moon. It was about the astronauts and how they were brave and all these other adjectives and then they walked on the moon. Mm -hmm. um, I do also sing as an avocation. And uh, I spent a lot of time making music when I was a child too. Mm -hmm. And I think my writing tends to be very musical sounding. Mm -hmm. So um, the first time they put me up on a, this little stage at a park in Oklahoma City, they thought I was going to sing like Twinkle Twinkle Little Stars. But I started singing these boots are made for walking. Oh, <laughs> so they had, they had to come take me down off the stage because everybody was <laughs> gathered around watching this little three-year-old. Oh my goodness, you're a three. <laughs> yeah, with my, her boots walking. Mm -hmm. So I started all of those kinds of things pretty early. Mm -hmm. Even though, well, I couldn't see, and I may have mentioned this to you before, but... My mother said she had a special way she was going to teach me to sing, like to read music. Mm -hmm. And she got me a chalkboard and she would put notes on it and ask me if I could see them and draw them. And I, she said I would just stand there and cry. Well, later we realized that I couldn't see. And that's why I would just stand there and cry. And then she said one night, she heard my dad and, and me outside howling at the moon, as she calls it. So she was disappointed that she didn't get her special way to teach me. But I managed to learn <laughs> about <laughs> music, too. Did you play uh, an instrument or do you just sing? I played piano a little bit. And if you major in voice performance, you're required to minor in piano. Oh, okay. So I have a minor in piano and Spanish and then degrees in music, vocal music and literature. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I was always real artsy like that because I spent so much time by myself. I would think of lots of ways to amuse myself mm -hmm. like they never could find anything for me to do in English because I I knew everything in English mm -hmm. my mother learned to speak straight out of the textbook 
And so she, she spoke both Spanish and English with perfect grammar. So um, uh, there wasn't much I was getting out of taking English at school. But what I did, I taught myself literary criticism of a sort because I would make a top 20 list of songs, my, just my favorite pop songs for the week. And on the left side of my journal, I would write all the lyrics. And then on this page, I would write my own analysis of what it meant. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, I started doing this when I was like 10. Okay. So by the time I was 13, I had built up quite a billboard stack of journals that I kept and where I wrote about what the songs meant. So did so you those are my, be, oh yeah, yeah those are my earlier yeah um, writing experiences yeah and I like hearing about that so we can see how all of that has influenced you kind of along along the way so when you were younger did you want to become a professor or do something with your writing or did you have dreams of doing something totally different well my first dream was in vocal music mm -hmm. and so I always wanted to be a teacher when I was a child but once I discovered vocal music I wanted to be a professional chorister like in the Robert Shaw Chorale or the Los Angeles Master Chorale things like that and then I, I didn't it didn't end up happening so I didn't sing professionally, but um, I was able to go to my other major, which was English, and, and focus on that. And the higher I got in school, the more I wanted to teach that grade. So when I got to college, then I decided, oh, forget those other grades. I want to teach in college. So that's what I did. And I started as a TA when I was 25 years old. Mm -hmm. So I was already getting to fulfill one of my dreams teaching yeah. in college. Yeah, I think that's great. And I was gonna ask you a little bit more just about your educational path after mm -hmm. high school. Um, so you, you mentioned that you had, um, you had degrees in music and Spanish and English as well mm -hmm. as, your, mm -hmm. as an undergrad. Mm -hmm. um, what inspired you to keep going with with your studies? Oh, because you eventually got your master's and PhD. Mm -hmm. So could we talk about that that journey? Who maybe was influential to you in that point? Because it, it can be a long a long haul mm -hmm. when you're when you get into that level of of your studies and, and right your, sure. right. Well, I just always loved learning so much. Mm -hmm that it was just hard for me to stop. And I also really loved teachers because a lot of times the kids at school would be mean to me, but the teachers liked me usually okay because um, I knew how to behave and knew how to do the work and everything. But so I always had a big respect for teachers and that was part of my drive to keep going and get a PhD. I think I wanna be like this teacher. I wanna be like this teacher. Mm -hmm. And my mentor in grad school was Dr. Linda Level. And she's retired now and is writing. And so I'm sort of following in that path too because mm -hmm. I'm writing a lot more now that I've retired from teaching. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the writing part that definitely requires that time mm -hmm. and space mm -hmm. which we'll we'll get to that um later on in the interview but one thing i wanted to talk about um and this is something we discussed before we started recording today in a previous session um, together um could we talk about beauty and nature and just the role that um those have played in your life yeah i think and, and this is probably what you're referring to that yeah. I've talked a lot about that in Oklahoma, mm -hmm. people have to work really hard 
to find beauty. And what I mean is, you know, like there was the Dust Bowl and then all these man-made lakes. Yeah. Seems like the most beautiful things here are man-made. And so you're always having to look around and see what's beautiful. And my parents were really good at teaching us how to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we never went anywhere without them saying, look over there, there's an eagle. Or look over there, there's something, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was always that idea of looking for something exciting and beautiful. Not yeah. that it would just be there, you know, but you had to really look for it. Mm -hmm. Did you teach your students how to do that? I tried. Well? Yeah. I, and tell I me really, about that. I really tried to. When I, um, toward the end of my teaching career, I was selected by the Honors College to teach an honors seminar. Mm -hmm. And this was, then I discovered that I could teach whatever I wanted. And I thought, yeah. oh my gosh, I can teach whatever I want. Well, what do I really want to teach that I haven't already, you know? Mm -hmm. So I decided that I wanted to teach the seminar on aesthetics mm -hmm. and beauty. And I was going to learn along with the students what made certain things more beautiful than other things, you know, the aesthetic theory. And then the, uh, the music, the classical music I knew, the literature, and the art, a lot of which I learned from uh, Linda Lovell, I put all that together as examples. So we would read aesthetic theory, and then we would try to apply it to different examples, like a painting from the Rococo period. What makes that beautiful in that period that you might not see in a modern painting, for example? What kinds of things were people concerned about in culture that they could then turn into a form of beauty as we get to look at it? So I tried to give them both theories and experiences because since they're honor students, I figured if they had some of the theory, you know, that would that would also stick with them. In fact, I've taken them to the um, art gallery downtown, mm -hmm. the OSU, not Modella, the OSU art gallery. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was so exciting to follow my students around in the yeah. museum and hear them say things like, do you think that's sort of reminiscent of Picasso? And then the other student would say, yeah, I can see that because of the angles in the faces. And I was just like, oh my God, they learned something. Oh, I know, yeah, I was gonna ask, you know. It's um, so thrilling. Getting those insights from them, mm -hmm. especially especially if, if they are, if students are resistant to something or think, mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. have anything to say about right, this right. or that or making those connections. Right. That's always I, exciting. I even taught them words like, um, you know how we make an adjective out of a proper noun? Mm -hmm. So this is kind of like an Aristotelian argument or this is a Freudian interpretation. So <laughs> I would teach them those words so that they would have things to say other than I like this or I don't like this, you know, so that they could apply the theories and the theorists that we've studied as they talked about the art or the music or the literature. Mm -hmm. So that was my favorite teaching gig of yeah. all time. Yeah, yeah. That, I, I was looking through all of the courses that you've taught over the years and that one looked like a like a lot of fun yeah it I'd, is i'd ask yeah. about that so you yeah taught for a long time right mm -hmm. how many years were you a teacher so it you started was, at age uh, started when i was 25 and I, I retired early when i was um 50 oh i don't remember yeah in, in my 50s 
and I'm still okay. in my fifties. So I haven't okay. been retired that long. Okay. What have you, what did you learn about yourself as a teacher during that time? How do you think you, you grew? Well, I learned, one thing I learned is that I'm very didactic and I'm trying to stop that. <laughs> <laughs> I always want everyone to not only experience something, but to experience what I tell them to experience. <laughs> and I know that's not the right approach. So I try not to be so, you know, such a know-it-all and just let them learn from the books and from looking at the artwork or listening to the music. And so another thing I learned as a teacher is how to present assignments so that the students really get interested in them. And um, because I remember it was uh, 2006 and I was getting kind of burnout because I'd been teaching freshman comp for a long time, along with other things, but still almost every semester I'd have freshman comp. And I was in a rut. So I thought, what can I do to make this more exciting for myself? Because the students, they're gonna, they, they come and they're either going to invest in it or not, you know. So I wanted to make it more exciting for me. And I knew that my favorite student papers were ones they had written about musical topics. So I decided to make all of freshman comp of my classes based on music. So like if the department said the first assignment has to be a persuasive letter, Mine students would write a letter to, you know, like um, Jack White and ask him, why don't you record more rock music? Why are you getting into the blues? Or, you know, just a request or a, any kind of question to a musical artist. Mm -hmm. And then when they had to work on audience and criteria, I would say, well, so write a playlist and write it for a specific person. And with each song, give a blurb explaining why you put it in this playlist for them. So that really taught them a lot about purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, every assignment, I just made it so that it still followed the program, but it was musical. Mm -hmm. And the first semester I did that, a student wanted her nonprofit organization to be able to get a free booth at, I think it was Lollapalooza. She said if they got it, it would be worth $40,000 because it's expensive to have a booth there. But since they're a nonprofit, they didn't want to have to pay for it. So she writes her persuasive letter to the leaders of Lollapalooza oh. and she sends it in and actually wins a free booth at Lollapalooza. Wow. Worth $40,000 just from her persuasive letter for freshman comp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so oh, that was amazing. pretty exciting. Yeah. Then was... they can really see how how true and important writing is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that can be hard <laughs> mm -hmm. to, get, to get across. Mm -hmm. them. Oh, that's a great yeah. story. So I wanted to go back a little bit um, and let's just go back to your journey in graduate school. So you just talked about teaching comp and the burnout that that can, um, that can cause. And I think maybe the same thing can happen in, in graduate school. What kind of kept you going creatively there? I mean, you're doing all of this literary analysis, but then were you also um, writing poetry or doing other creative things with your music? At yeah, the same time? I, I was doing literary analysis and writing poetry mm -hmm. and keeping a journal. Mm -hmm. I always 
made my literary papers really exciting and interesting mm -hmm. because if it was just kind of like a boring topic, I would never finish. The only reason I finished is that my advisor let me write about what I wanted to write about. And I didn't just take advantage of that in some goofy way. I mean, I really wrote about appropriate for dissertation topics. It's just that, for example, in my dissertation, it was about student and teacher relationships in the collection of stories, Winesburg, Ohio. So people always think, oh, I thought your degree was in literature. You mean you went to study a school in Winesburg, Ohio? I'm like, no, <laughs> no. It's, it's a novel. It's a book. And, and that's just the name of it. It's by Sherwood Anderson. So I wrote several chapters about student-teacher relationships. And um, in between each chapter, I wrote a little vignette that was like um, creative nonfiction about an actual teacher event that I had had that kind of went with the chapter in the dissertation. So I feel like Linda Lovell really spoiled me <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. she let me write about, I would say, can I write about this? She'd say, sounds great. So yeah. she let me write really about everything I wanted to write about. Yeah, it's important to have a mentor like that. Mm -hmm. I think that mm -hmm. would give you that <clears throat> sort of freedom that it sounds like you've passed that on to your students too throughout, uh -huh. throughout your career, just to promote that, um, yeah. that engagement. Now you did spend some time in Ithaca, New York, is that right? Uh-huh. How long were you there and what was that experience like? You were teaching? Yes, well, so I got married to Anthony Cable. He's a mathematician. And he stayed an extra year until I finished my PhD mm -hmm. so that we would, because we were about on the same schedule. Mm -hmm. And he didn't apply for anything that first year. But then when we were ready to start applications, the best one, the best offer was that he had an offer for a three-year postdoc at Cornell. So we moved to Cornell and or to Ithaca and he taught at Cornell and I taught at Ithaca College. It was really strange to me mm -hmm. because, well, in Oklahoma, even if students don't have a lot of background in literature, they still know a lot about certain subjects like maybe religion or something like that, that you can find some common ground to um, teach them new things. And even though we both thought that going to Ithaca, New York meant we were gonna have these really awesome students who were inquisitive and hardworking and curious we really liked the students at OSU better. Oh, really? Because the students at OSU, they're pretty rough around the edges, but they they try so hard to be polite. Mm -hmm. You get the ag people, and they're yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, and or you get, you know, a lot of the other majors. They're just very polite, and we decided we liked that you know, better than in, in New York, everybody and their grandparents go to Cornell or somewhere important. So to them, it's just kind of like, eh, another degree, you know, mm -hmm. but in Oklahoma, you get a lot of first generation college students and they are, are taught by their families to really respect education. I know it sounds like it wouldn't work, but I really enjoy teaching in Oklahoma because of those mm -hmm. students. Yeah, yeah, well, that's, I think that's good to hear. And I'm, I'm glad that we could put that on the record. Um, mm -hmm. Oklahomans in general, and 
I think sometimes students um, just aren't maybe understood mm -hmm. what they can bring mm -hmm. to class, especially a writing right. class. I just think about the work you've done with teaching people how to look and how to observe and how that mm -hmm. started mm -hmm. at such a young age for right. you. Right, and how to listen. And then, yeah. The and important listen. things about listening. Mm -hmm. And I usually give, because I'm very didactic, I give these little lectures to them at the end of the year of things I want them to remember. If you don't remember anything else from this class. And one of the things I lecture them about is about listening. Because Oklahoma students, if you have an accent that's anything other than Oki, they go, they're like, I can't understand what they're saying. It's just they're not used to listening. And so through music, my ear is so attuned to all sounds, whether it's an accent or music, that I try to teach them that too. I try to teach them how to listen for things like the hook in a song or, you know, even the tricky hook that makes you think the hook is coming, but then it's not. So you keep listening. Mm -hmm. um, and they respond really well to being taught new things like that. And especially if you have enough of a background similar to theirs that, you know, you can throw in talking about whether you catch more bass than crappie at a certain lake. And, you know, if you have kind of a similar background to them, they appreciate that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they're, they're always very polite and they have a lot of respect for education. And I, we value that a lot. Yeah. And did you have a, a young family at the time that you were in New York or? No, I had a son from a previous okay. marriage. Oh, so okay. he was a teenager, a teenager when we went okay. to New York. Okay. And when we got ready to come back to Oklahoma, mm -hmm. he decided Oklahoma no longer had anything to offer him because mm -hmm. he was a teenager and all his yeah. friends were in New York. So he stayed for a, about 10 years, I guess, mm -hmm. and lived by himself in New York. Oh, Not okay. New York City, but in Ithaca. And, uh -huh. Yeah, I'd wondered yeah. about that because in addition to finishing up your, your dissertation, moving across the country, taking on this new role um, at the Ithaca um, College, and there's always other things going on in mm -hmm. in in our lives, and, like getting married, or like getting married, <laughs> like and, a second marriage, and yeah, or yeah. or remarried. How you know? I think it's really important to talk about um, how we are supported in our creative mm -hmm. lives or in our scholarly endeavors. Um, if you'd like to speak to that, I mean, I think you've accomplished a lot. Mm -hmm. you know, and in what ways maybe did your partner support you? Well, just in, you know, waiting until I finished yeah. to yeah. apply for jobs was a huge help. Oh, yes. And he paid off a lot of my bills while we were getting ready to move to Ithaca because he was just working, teaching. Mm -hmm. And he made lots of pots of iced tea for me to drink so the caffeine would keep me going on my mm -hmm. dissertation he helped me with computer problems mm -hmm. you know, when i was because i wrote my master's thesis before computers so oh. it was a whole new thing to try to write a dis dissertation on a computer oh right yeah and with yeah. your research you know the mm -hmm. whole the process of finding our primary text yes how that works is so different. right it was very different yeah we'd have to sometimes you'd have to crawl under a table in the library to get to a shelf <laughs> and yeah see that's why we have such respect for education here we have to work really hard for it mm -hmm. <laughs> we have to yeah i'm here and yeah carry it's this not a there's benefits yeah. to the, you know, to the technology and the online component mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. things, um, but 
yeah, there, there are also other ways of, of doing yeah. things and it's not so bad to, you know, come to the library if you can and dig mm -hmm. through the stacks. It mm -hmm. can well, and my son, when he was little, I taught him to carry books for me. So <laughs> we would go up to the circulation desk and I'd have like two, like 20 books. And this little two-year-old has his eight books and we set them up on the counter it always made people look strangely at Jordan because he was and he but he didn't he just took it in stride you know I'm just yeah. here to check out these books my mom needs them you know? <laughs> oh, so he was he was a big part of my early life in school yeah because he he really helped me by being well behaved by being interested in learning so so I had my son and my second husband were both really big helps to me. Mm -hmm. Were there particular <clears throat> stories that you enjoyed reading to your son when he was little? Well, you can remember for a bedtime, maybe... I used to read to him out of um, out of Ovid's Metamorphosis. Oh, because I figured it was like creation stories. And yeah. that's usually what we introduce first to children from the Bible. Mm -hmm. So I would read to him from a Christian Bible, and then I would read to him from Ovid. And <laughs> so he learned a lot about mythology mm -hmm. in his reading. And he was very unique. Um, he's real smart, but... Like he loved as a three-year-old, he loved punctuation. Oh, really? I mean, it was weird. He invented his own punctuation mark and used it and explained to others how to use it. He was just very interesting, mm -hmm. very interesting child. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about um, your work as a writer and I brought, if we were in person, I would just give you a photocopy of whatever it was I thought might be good to read. Um, did you, do you have copies of I have a few anything things. with yeah. you that you'd like to read? I'd like to, if you're okay with reading something, um, I always think it's nice for listeners to have a chance mm -hmm. to hear the work. And then I'd like to talk about your process because you have some interesting things that you do creatively, especially when you're writing your, your poetry, um, uh -huh. you know, just that lyricism and that, that. Yeah. And the music and, and music. the rhythm and yeah. Yeah. Well, so this one is probably more a narrative than a song, mm -hmm. but it gives a lot of detail about living in Oklahoma and the, okay. the kinds of inequality that you find. Mm -hmm. I think because I guess Oklahoma is mostly Caucasian people and a lot of them are very poor. And I think that's part of some of the racial misunderstandings in Oklahoma is we have so many poor Caucasian families and they don't get this, you know, all the talk about white privilege. So this is kind of about living across the alley from some less privileged children. And that sounds like a judgment. I mean, they may have had a great life, but it was just different from mine. And it's called Trash Day in Norman, Oklahoma. The kids across the alley believed everything the garbage man said, and he told us where the trash goes. Under the ground, there is a big fire that burns it all up. The garbage goes to hell. Do you know what that means? Are you a sinner? Even the public utility personnel knew there was a hell something we had heard so little about that it failed to register as we stared at their bare feet and their cotton top heads. The kids across the alley smirked at us and scratched their necks like stray dogs. And when we dared to speak, we asked, 
why is your washing machine outside? And we learned there were some people who didn't own stores, but who had things for sale. And the kids across the alley had three tires for sale too. And their cats ate out of cool metal pans, which we didn't recognize as hubcaps turned on the vertex, spinning across our yards, we counted out loud while the cotton-headed kids recited poetry about seeing London. We blew dandelions and built sandcastles because we read about things like that at the public library. We knew not to cross the alley, but it was our sore heels tiptoeing in keds, creeping toward a tackle box full of keys, and bags of old clothing strewn across the yard. Are you giving these things to the poor? We would ask. And the poor would butt things with dirty buckets on their heads. Little robots screaming with glee as though eternity were a great big joke to which only they and maintenance workers knew the answer. And the kids across the alley cheered for the OU Sooners who probably did well in the 1950s, but not so well as the kids across the alley who made sure no one but their parents ever busted their butts. And the underworld churned and roared in my dreams. Red spikes followed by orange explosions and puffy yellow curls of smoke until I cried out in the night, God, save me. My mother blamed the city. Childhood must be pretty good if those keys are on your wrist, though flipping round and round on big chains. You own the world, you kids across the alley. Ooh, thank you for sharing that. That's just so um, vivid, it, your your imagery, everything mm -hmm. there. And um just the the topic I think that that says just compresses so much mm -hmm. into into one space can we talk a little bit about your writing process and maybe um, the process that you took for writing this particular poem or maybe other other works as well yeah um, well my usual process is to listen to music first mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll hear a song and the rhythm really sticks with me. And I think this rhythm would be good for a certain topic, you know? So I, um, I didn't bring the poem headlines, but I, that was one that I wrote while listening to a certain song because um, there's just this line in REM Strange Currencies with with love comes strange currencies and um i thought about my father and losing his sight gradually but pretty rapidly really after he developed diabetes and i thought with faltering sight comes a fondness for headlines and it was kind of like that song you know, now with love comes strange currencies. And, but instead I would think with faltering sight comes a fondness for headlines. I like to use alliteration or <clears throat> consonants to, you know, make, make the reader feel something different. Because you can even speed up or slow down how fast your reader approaches your work if you know certain techniques to use. Mm -hmm. With this poem, I didn't really think of a rhythm. It's just this story kept, just stayed with me forever since I was three. And it never occurred to me that it could be a poem until I thought, I've just got to write this down. It's I can't forget this, you know? Mm -hmm. So I started writing it down and just sort of shaped it into a narrative poem. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I didn't even, 
understand it myself until I wrote the poem about it. You know, I didn't realize that those children had all that junk in their yard because they might be poor or, you know, and they're trying to sell stuff to make extra money until I started writing the poem that that hadn't occurred to me, which I just think is amazing how many things we overlook or just don't realize until you really, really have to think about things, just like the beauty, you know, you have to really be willing to look and listen. And to find meaning, you have to be really willing to think, just Mm -hmm. think deeply. That was the first thing that confused me when I started teaching, because some students could write passably well, but they had no depth to what they were talking about. And I didn't know exactly how to grade that. Yeah. Do you count off against someone's grade because they don't have deep insight? Well, if you told them ahead of time on the criteria, I'm looking for deep insight, you know, then you can, it turns out. But in general, you know, do you, do you penalize someone for not thinking deeply? It was really hard for me to make decisions like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's one of those intangible ones because really it, you, it's hard to put that down, get that all in in a rubric. Let's just mm-hmm. say that. And if you're mm-hmm. getting that analytical with it, do they even have the space to mm-hmm. dream and think or maybe be shown right. some other connection or another way of of seeing and I think Mm -hmm. that goes back to what we've talked about throughout your um your career is um just helping people see Mm -hmm. what they might think you know that's what reading does for us and that's why it's important Mm -hmm. to create art and music to to inspire that but to help Mm -hmm. but to help young people dig deeper and you know when when we're teaching that Mm -hmm. I don't know if I have an answer to it but there there's something to I think like you said with that the story about the children that just wouldn't leave you Mm -hmm. thinking about it and then processing it and actually writing it down Mm -hmm. whether it's whether you draft by hand or you're typing it up getting it out of the brain and your intellect into the realm of uh, words, then mm-hmm. it's there, then someone else could read it too. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one way to share yeah. who we are. Yes, for sure. I would hope. And you know, with poems, the inspiration can come from all different, you mm-hmm. know, it's, it's, some people, it always starts with an image. Some people hear maybe a line that they just can't uh, get out of their mind. Do you have mm-hmm. um do you have a typical way that you kind of begin with, with their poetry or is it just really, really different? If I, if I don't have a particular song in mind, then I like to look at beautiful poetry Mm -hmm. because that's one of my goals is to make something instead of just words, it's going to be beautiful, beautiful words. When you say them in your mouth, it feels beautiful. So I have some favorite poets and poems that I look at. Um, One is Shakespeare sonnets. Mm -hmm. Another is E.E. Cummings. Mm -hmm. And uh, between Shakespeare and Cummings, I have so much beauty to choose from. You know, they just listen to this. And I don't know if I say it exactly right. If I could write the beauty of your eyes and with each number, number all your graces, the world would say in time, this poet lies. Such heavenly beauty ne'er touched earthly faces. Isn't that gorgeous? Yes, yes. Sometimes I just sit around and say that to myself. 
Yeah. And until I'm starting to feel some rhythm mm -hmm. in a kind of like a vine coming out of it and reaching into a different topic, but it's the mm -hmm. same rhythm, you know. Mm -hmm. Or just reading your own drafts. Mm -hmm. So I know mm -hmm. I have, when I've talked to other writers, especially those who teach writing, getting students to um, speak their their own words mm -hmm. out loud makes mm -hmm. a big difference because you can you, you can always catch things, yeah. hear things in a different yes. And I hear, you know, like I can't really emphasize this enough how much I learned to hear by not being able to see when I was a mm. kid. Mm -hmm. And um, it helps me understand music. It helps me understand the rhythm of language. And um, my mother even commented lately, she was telling me about a dream she had about my brother and me. And she said that in the dream, my dad said something about leaving something for the kids. And she said, we don't have any kids. When she said that, it, my heart stopped pounding. You know, I was just like, oh, my God, what if I didn't exist? She just said, we don't have any kids. And he said, yes, we do. Look. And she said that when she looked, she saw that he was right. They had kids. First, it was Belinda, and you had that look on your face. And I'm like, what look? I had a look when I was three. You know, like, what was my look? She said, you always looked like you were listening to something. And I thought, hmm. well, I was. I always yeah. was listening to something. And, like, I want to just say a little bit of this poem. Because okay, yeah. I was going to ask if, are there others that, I that think, you'd like to read and talk about? Yeah, parts of this are so um, beautiful because, you know, we all think babies are beautiful, and especially if it's related to us. But my granddaughter was born with this hair in a circle so that mm -hmm. she had one long curl on one side. And I wrote, when I was describing that, the pattern of her hair in utero becoming one long curl on the left side of her head, her features unfolding like snowflakes where scissors took random bites out of white paper. And I just think that's really pretty features mm -hmm. unfolding you know like babies do because they're kind of smashed in faces mm -hmm. at first yeah so the features have to kind of unfold and mm -hmm. um i just like to put words together in ways that are beautiful to me mm -hmm. and listening to a lot of music helps me to recognize when something is really beautiful yeah and taking what's from your life or what you might be observing or seeing you know you don't have to be anywhere in particular you don't have to live in new york city or mm -hmm. la or wherever to find something that is worth writing mm -hmm. about which is a point i do like to make throughout this whole project because we have so much beauty in our writing here and in our literary community mm -hmm. with our Oklahoma writers so and yeah. it's it's kind of like um if you think about therapy like if a person goes into therapy and they tell their story you can learn to revise your own past in a way that makes it more beautiful. And I hesitate to say that because I don't mean if you're abused, you should find beauty in that. But I mean, if I were going to show you the best photographs of my life, wouldn't I want to show you the most beautiful ones? You know, the times I really want to remember and the way I want to remember it. I recently realized 
that even as I thought all those kids were so mean to me when I was a child, I was the most enlightened and self-actualized eight-year-old I knew Mm -hmm. (laughs) because I had a lot of time to think about stuff. Yeah. So I wrote, I want to read this one because it's a lot about how beautiful my son was Mm -hmm. as a child. And I don't mean just physical beauty, but um, the things that he learned from me to find, to find beautiful. So it's called One Man Band because he came out of his room one time and he had tied all his instruments onto his body. And he said, look, Belinda, because he called me Belinda. He said, look, Belinda. You're the poet, and I'm the one-man band. And, of course, he had gotten that from Simon and Garfunkel's Mm -hmm. song. So that's why I named it that. I remember his darkest secrets, instruments tied to his little body, harmonica glued to a hanger, Simon and Garfunkel lyrics copied copiously, magic marker ships sailing across his pants. His love of ellipses brings me to this place, to finding sheet music again, marked and wrinkled as if unwanted, like a baby about to be given away, ink on its foot, burnix in its creases, following movement with those eyes from day one, I wrote for him, Deep blue they were, then marbled. He called me the poet and tested colorblind for school, choosing not simply the wrong answers, but exactly the answers the sight deprived would indicate, much to the examiner's excitement. We laughed, certain he could see the world as clearly as anyone, and besides, an artist's genes were there for the taking. I knew when I made him, like my mother before me, under the chinaberry tree of stifled pleasure sound, when summer, summer was singing. And now I find he's here again, looking at me as my mouth searches plum, papaya, paradise, crawling on my belly, finding food. Never again will nourishment be the same. But still he comes to me, ritualistically gripping down, car seat over his arm, tablature on his sleeve, organic diaper in his trouser pocket, holding his daughter out for me to love and relinquish. He's a one man band at three again, showing me the words as I try to picture what he sees, gray for green, Cream for yellow, brown for purple, cornucopia of muted color, silent O's of pure, relentless loss. Oh, that's gorgeous. Thank you for sharing that. I almost didn't use the word loss, Mm -hmm. but I think about losing our infancy you know yeah when your child grows up it is a loss it is yes and um yeah he he played like this all the time you know like Mm -hmm. making music writing poems doing whatever i was doing so Mm -hmm. it's very flattering yes (laughs) it's very (laughs) flattering to have a two-year-old because they just think you're awesome Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so so yeah, and he um, he's a musician and a writer as well. And um, he writes amazing poetry. It's really beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But poetry isn't the only thing you write. You all, you're also working on a novel or is that mm-hmm. is that right? Yeah, what do you want to say about that? Because that's a whole other experience, yeah. right? Well, it's my first novel, so Mm -hmm. 
one thing I want to say is you should learn how to write a novel before you start. <laughs> because yeah. I was writing it and learning how to write a novel at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of difficult that way. You know, like I did a lot of things the hard way before I realized, oh, I could have done this or I could have set this up already, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I'm enjoying the writing of it so much. And it's based on a true thing in my family. So my great grandmother was kidnapped when she was 13 into Pancho Villa's militia. Oh. And so she lived for five years during the Mexican Revolution out in the, the camps with the soldiers. There were a lot of women during the Mexican Revolution who had that experience, but most of them died. So Pancho Villa was kind of mean. And if he was had a camp somewhere and supplies were running low and they were going to move on, he would just abandon the women and leave them to starve or shoot them because you could always get more women at the next place. So I started thinking, why did my great grandmother live five years when most of the women in his army died? And that's what gave me the idea to write the novel. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's based on the a brother and sister like me and my brother and they they take turns being narrator so the brother will narrate and then things progress but it goes into the sister's perspective of what's going on and then their father is dying and there are complications that come with that um so yeah, I'm, I'm also experimenting with um, technique. So I have my aunts who are a formidable force, even when not fictionalized. <laughs> but I have my aunts and I call them in the novel Los Tias. The brother doesn't like to be around a lot of Hispanic women. The sister she's fine with it you know anyway I'm using them kind of like a Greek chorus so the, the effect I'm trying to create is that whenever Los Tias come onto the scene almost like a light motif in music I want everybody reading it to think oh here come the tias again mm -hmm. the ants the sisters and cousins and ants like the gilbert and sullivan but for mexican women and so um they're they're like this little this crew of mexican women and they will make commentary on what's going on or they'll talk about whether well, he's never going to be able to get her to do that you know and just make make remarks about what's going on and one of the things that's going on is as the father is dying Las Tias are worried about the um the fate of his eternal soul so they're trying to get him baptized or to say something about his future afterlife so it's a little bit of humor there too if you can imagine like the reason for having a chorus it's it serves a function but it can also be kind of fun mm -hmm. yeah so keeping track of all of that and writing in these circumstances we're in now with the with the pandemic and all of that how do you keep yourself going it sounds like maybe you you don't have a problem with re refueling your your creativity or just having that drive to to keep well going. i don't have a problem refueling my creativity that's mm -hmm. correct 
But, you know, I do have a lot of chronic illnesses that make it really difficult for me to sit and write for very long. Mm -hmm. So it is sometimes hard to keep going. Yeah. And especially because writing is so isolating anyway. Yeah. Because it's a lone thing that you do. And then to add to that, well, you couldn't do it with someone if you wanted to. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right now, it it does get very difficult to keep staying motivated mm -hmm. to do the hard things. I'm I don't have a problem with motivation to do the fun things. Uh -huh. Thanks to Linda Lovell, I, if any, if something can be made fun, I can get it done. Mm -hmm. But if it's a boring thing, I don't want to have to be in pain or use up my energy for something right. kind of boring. So, but sometimes we have to do little boring things like change the paper in the printer and just different things like that. Yeah, there's a lot of writing can be very tedious yeah you know even yeah. something that we're passionate about mm -hmm. it, it can still be. so do you work in just shorter time periods or make sure mm -hmm. that you're starting at a good time of day for yeah. you managing yeah them? i usually work best from like 10 to noon mm -hmm. and then again in the afternoon but i try not to do it to write for more than two hours at a time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and knowing yourself too. Yeah, that. sometimes I don't make it to the second sitting. So mm -hmm. it's that's part of the reason it's been a long yeah. process, but I'm almost finished. Oh, wow. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, having that self-compassion, I think, yes. is something that, that is good. And I'm glad that we could mention that and have that mm -hmm. on record mm -hmm. here. Um, so I know there's other people who might have similar. Uh, there there records, are, you know? I find a lot of people online that have similar problems. And part yeah. of the reason they're writing is that it's something they can do without necessarily having to show up in front of people and be ready to turn on, you know, mm -hmm. like it is with teaching. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. So what encouragement would you give to writers in Oklahoma? Well, <clears throat> I think it helps if you know what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So you could go out and stare at a pond and not come away with much. You know, it was kind of scummy and goopy stuff and or you could stare at a pond waiting you know just to be a writer in Oklahoma you need to expect that something amazing is going to happen hmm. and if you can go through your life with that kind of attitude it makes things a lot more fun. Even if you're hurting or your blood sugar is bad, you can still have a really good time if you're curious. And if you keep your curiosity up your whole life, even if you get frail, that curiosity is really our life force. And to be continually curious about what's out there or why this happened, I think makes a good writer. A lot of times I get topics just by thinking, well, this happened, but what if it happened to a gay man? Or this happened, but what if it happened to, you know, a single mother? And just realizing that sometimes life is stranger than fiction and if you just look, you know, you'll see all kinds of really amazing things. Mm -hmm. Even if it's just, uh, you know, we have a lot of good road signs. Yes. In Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are some real funny ones. Like, you know, at the Oklahoma bait and tackle worms in the rear. That kind of thing. If you drive through Oklahoma, you find these signs in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Or like you find this little store and it says, we rent videos. And you're like, oh my God, <laughs> we rent videos. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you can find interesting little places and things happening, mm -hmm. but you have to be willing to sit and look and listen. Yes. And uh, to, to be curious about what you're seeing and hearing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's great. Is there any other writing advice that you would want to give people or maybe something that has been given to you from a mentor that you'd like to share? Hmm. Yeah, a lot of the things that help me with my writing, because I don't have trouble with the creative part, it's the stick to it part. You know? <laughs> yeah. So a lot of times it helps me to think about things like just stay there, you know, just come to your chair and your computer and don't leave until you have something. And um, yeah, that's that's a big part of my advice. Mm -hmm. It's just to be constantly looking and mm -hmm. trying to share things that were meaningful to you. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that then, showing, the showing up part. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like my parents, they they saw so much beauty and that was one of the best things they did as parents was teach us to find it whether it was like music or an earthworm or something you know but just they taught us how to look and listen yeah so was there anything else you'd like to talk about um I was thinking that of all the new things I'm learning to do with writing a novel, mm -hmm. the some of the hardest things are questioning yourself, you know, and, and worrying if you're going to get a publisher and those kinds of things. So my both my husband and my mentor from grad school have told me that I should just write what I want and not think about where really whether it's going to be published or whether I should say this or say that to an agent, you know, instead of worrying about performance issues like that, I'll just write what I want to write. And I want to write beautiful things. So it happens pretty easily for me if I, you know, if I don't get too worried about mm -hmm. all the other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. All of the, the those other things will, will come in time so. and later. Hopefully. Yeah. 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 Hopefully. And also I wanted to mention that if anybody who likes to write ever has a chance to teach, even if it's just teaching freshman comp, you will learn so much about writing from teaching it. Mm -hmm. And anything you end up having to teach, whether you wanted to teach or not, it's going to teach you a lot of things. Yes. Because, you know, you start teaching and at some point early on, you get that fraud alert thing like, oh, my God, I'm a fraud. I don't know any more than the students know. And I don't, you know, so I would cram for days if I had to teach a play that I had never taught before. You know, I studied that harder than I studied for comps. Oh, wow. <laughs> because I didn't want to look stupid to exactly. my students. Yeah. So. And another thing about teaching is that I think most people will love it if they give it a chance. And um, the students that kind of stay in touch, you know that you've really made a difference in their life. And um, I think it's, 
one of the greatest things you can do. So I wouldn't go into writing thinking of teaching as a thing to fall back on. Teaching is something where you can really improve your own skills and learn a lot. All right. Well, that's great. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Belinda, and your patience mm -hmm. with this remote interviewing stuff. It's it's the new world, and here we are. But I really appreciate your participation in this. All right. Well, thank you. Thank and you. thanks for giving me the chance to share some of my work. Oh, sure. And, absolutely. And talk about talk about my writing process. That's always yeah. really fun.